Why would someone, who claims to be your friend and boss, just end up keeping your body just sitting in your office while you have an evening with the family? This is the truly sad story of Valerie, who with her family, moved to be away from a life surrounded by crime and despair, only to find herself face to face with the evil situation. Valerie Tyndall was born on August 29, 2005, in Indianapolis, Indiana. She was the daughter of Jack Tyndall and Sheena Sandifer, and she had one brother and three sisters. Sadly, Valerie had experienced trauma at an early age, and her mom felt it was best for their whole family to move somewhere safer, so they packed up and moved to Arlington. It was less than an hour out of the city and had a much smaller area. It had a population of about 300. People move to smaller places like this in hopes that it's going to be a safer community. They really hoped that living in a small town, life would ease some of their concerns and make for a safer childhood for all of them. But sadly, even in this small town, violence still found this family. Specifically, it found Valerie. So last summer of 2023 was shaping up to be a really good summer for Valerie. She was 17 years old. She had just finished her junior year of high school at Rushville Consolidated High School. She was really looking forward to being a senior. Her junior year was a big year for her. She ended up really excelling in school. She went from struggling quite a bit in failing classes to getting all A's and B's. So the future was looking much brighter for her. She had big dreams of one day becoming a vet, and she was already in the process of pursuing that dream and was applying for colleges. She would never be able to fulfill that dream because of what happened on June 7, 2023. June 7 was a Wednesday, and obviously it was summer. So she was not in school, and Valerie had an extraordinarily strong work ethic. At 17, she was already working multiple jobs. She asked her mom if it would be okay if she worked that Wednesday even though she typically did not, and on this Wednesday she was referring to working a job that she did for her neighbor's lawn care business. Now this neighbor was 59-year-old Patrick Scott. Patrick and his family lived on a large property across the street from Valerie's family. Based on all the reporting in this case, Valerie and Patrick's relationship was not just a working relationship. The two of them were friends. Patrick had absolutely no business being close friends with a 17-year-old girl who he also employed. Valerie obviously is not at fault or to blame here it is obvious that he was grooming her. She was also close friends with his granddaughter. Plus, you must consider that he wasn't just some strange neighbor that the family didn't know. They were friends. The two families spent a lot of time together. According to Valerie's mom, Sheena, there are monsters out there, sometimes people that come across as very friendly. Monsters like Patrick Scott who manipulate people into making them believe that they are a good person when they are not, and clearly that is what Patrick did. He manipulated their family into believing that he had Valerie's best interest in mind. What we do know based on one report out there is that after Valerie disappeared, there were photos found in her room of her and Patrick together alone at the aquarium. That same report says that her parents actually knew about this aquarium visit and they even allowed her to go, but only because they were under the impression that it wasn't going to be just the two of them. They thought his entire family was going to be there and as a reminder she was very close with Patrick's granddaughter. But based on the photos, and the fact that nobody else is in them does appear that they were alone, and I imagine her parents wouldn't have allowed this if they knew this was going to be the case. Sheena does say that there were times where Patrick came across as a jealous boyfriend, but she also says that Valerie sort of always eased her concerns about Patrick. On the night of June 7th, obviously Valerie was supposed to spend the day working for Patrick, and she didn't come home so obviously when her daughter didn't come home, Sheena got concerned and she called Patrick. She asked if he knew where she was, but when she talked to Patrick, he said that not only did she not work that day, but they didn't even have plans for her to work. Maybe she lied about working and that she actually had plans to do something else, so she figured and hoped that Valerie actually had plans to hang out with some friends or possibly some boys and would hopefully be back soon, if not by the next morning. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. The night on the 7th, Patrick and his wife Linda came over to their house. Patrick started talking to them about the idea that maybe Valerie ran away. At that point, Sheena really started to become concerned. Here's this person starting to put ideas in her head that her daughter ran away, sort of seemingly jumping the gun at this point. That would obviously concern anyone. Sheena would learn that Patrick was only trying to steer her away from the truth, and the truth was that Valerie did not run away. Valerie was murdered, and Patrick was responsible. 
Valerie Tyndall was officially reported missing the following morning, June 8th. Two days later, the Indiana State Police issued a silver alert stating that she was last seen on June 7th around 12 p.m. and is believed to be in extreme danger. County Sheriff's Department is asking for your help finding a missing 17-year-old. This is Valerie Tyndall. She is missing from Arlington, Indiana. She was last seen around noon on Wednesday. The Sheriff's Department says she is believed to be in extreme danger. She is 5 feet 6 inches tall, weighs about 160 pounds with brown hair and hazel eyes. Valerie was last seen driving a green 2000 Honda Accord with an Indiana license plate, it's on your screen, ZYK833. Anyone with information is asked to call the Sheriff's Department at the number on your screen or just call 911. Immediately, there was major concern for Valerie from law enforcement and the public. The initial search efforts started right away. And part of those initial efforts, of course, involved questioning Patrick. After all, he was the person that Valerie said she was going to be spending the day with, the day that she disappeared. When he was questioned, of course he tells investigators that he didn't see Valerie at all on the 7th. He said that the last time he saw her was on the 6th. It did not take investigators long to figure out that he was lying, and that's because a witness actually saw Patrick and Valerie together on the 7th. Witnesses even said that they saw Patrick driving Valerie's car. When Patrick was confronted with all this information, he changed his story and of course that's always a big red flag when someone changes their story. Very often, that means that they are trying to hide something. This time Patrick says that yes, they were together on the 7th, but that he dropped her off at Homer, which is about 10 minutes down the road from Arlington. And he claims he didn't see her again after this, and during several interviews that took place in June, this is what Patrick had to say. He said that on the 7th he and Valerie first met up in Shelbyville at the South High Gardens condominiums. They left together in his work truck and while driving, Valerie asked to be dropped off in Homer, where he says that she then got into a pale blue car with an unknown male. The two of them started driving off in the direction of Rushville. Patrick changed his story yet again in later interviews and said that after they met up at the condominiums, she got into his work truck and that the two of them drove back to his place. He said that he left Valerie at his house while he went out to work for the day. When he came home, she was gone. Now this version makes it a little bit more believable than his first version is that phone records shows Valerie's last location was in the Arlington area. And remember Arlington is where Patrick and Valerie lived, so if she really did take off in some guy's car then her location likely would have been Homer. Patrick is still lying in this version of events because he didn't go to work that day, but it does line up with the location data of Valerie being at his house on the day that she disappeared. The location data isn't the only valuable thing that was recovered from the cell phone records. In fact, Patrick actually gave his cell phone over to police and allowed them to search it. In his phone, they found the last text message that Valerie sent him. It was at 11.23 a.m. on June 7th, and the message reads, I'll be there soon. And as for Patrick's messages, he sent her two texts, one at 5.40 p.m. on the 7th and the other at 2.46 p.m. on the 8th. And both of these times, he was asking where she was and obviously there was no reply. Now all of this information is valuable for two reasons. One, it confirms beyond a reasonable doubt that Patrick and Valerie were together that day, and two, we know that Patrick didn't need to ask Valerie where she was because he knew where she was. Sheena says that Patrick had her daughter's location shared with him on the Life360 app, which is so bizarre, and that he was constantly checking on her location. But if that was the case, and he really did have her location available to him at any time, why would he need to text her and ask where she was if he could just pull up his app and look for himself? And I'm sure many of you are thinking the same thing as me that the reason for this was to set up some sort of alibi or distance himself from Valerie on the 7th. Even though it is incredibly creepy that he was able to track her location, that it isn't illegal for him to do that, so investigators still had no way to make an arrest at this point. The good news is they did have enough information to arrest him for something else by the end of June. Patrick had misled investigators with false information on several occasions, and he was charged with a misdemeanor count of false information. Even though this was something, it wasn't the something that they truly wanted. They wanted to know where Valerie was, they wanted to find Valerie, and they just knew that Patrick was somehow involved. Weeks and then months went by, and there was still no sign of Valerie, but investigators were far from giving up. 
In fact, they were getting closer and closer to finding her each day. On October 11, 2023, when investigators finally were able to do a search of Patrick's property, and they brought cadaver dogs with them, and interestingly four dogs individually alerted to the scent of human remains at the property's pond. When they searched the pond turned up empty. The dog's handlers said it's very possible that the wind carried the scent of remains, and it landed where it did because water is actually really good at capturing odor. Investigator ordered a topography study of the property, which took place the following day with the help of helicopters. In doing this aerial search, investigators would be able to see if there were any disturbances in the land, or anything to indicate where the scent of human remains was traveling from, and they did end up noting multiple areas of obvious ground disturbance. Then things went quiet for a few weeks, and Valerie was still considered missing. There was no indication of how close they were to finding her. Thankfully, though, investigators weren't giving up. Seven weeks after the initial search, they conducted another search on Tuesday, November 28, 2023. Local and federal agents converged on Patrick's property, focusing their efforts on a large dirt pile covered in miscellaneous debris. And it was there buried under pounds of dirt that investigators discovered two wooden boxes. The first box contained paperwork and VHS tapes. The second box gave off a smell that told them exactly what they were going to find inside that second box. Wrapped in black plastic was Valerie's body. Valerie had on orange fingernail polish, and that was immediately identified as the same polish that she was seen wearing in a social media post from the day that she disappeared. Imagine the mixed emotions that everyone who loved Valerie was feeling. The relief, but also the horror and devastation of finally knowing that she was gone. Yes. They found Valerie, and that was their goal. They knew that they would probably not find her alive. The good news here is that Patrick was finally able to be arrested. He was arrested immediately and taken to the Rush County Sheriff's Office, where he actually made a full confession. A tragic end to the search for a missing teenager in the small town of Arlington. The Rush County coroner officially identified the remains found on Tuesday as Valerie Tyndall. The 17-year-old was reported missing in June. The remains were found on her neighbor's property, and tonight, that neighbor, Patrick Scott, is in jail facing a murder charge. During an official interview, Patrick confessed to strangling Valerie with the belt that he had been wearing on June 7th. This is truly disturbing, but he claims that he continued to wear that belt after using it to kill her. It turns out that on June 7th, Patrick and Valerie did, in fact, meet up at the condominiums in Shelbyville, and it was there that a witness actually overheard him telling Valerie that he was going to take her out to a special lunch in Indianapolis. Now this conversation occurred just a few hours before it suspected that Valerie was murdered, and there is no evidence to indicate that this special lunch actually occurred. In fact, police records indicate that Patrick drove Valerie back to his home by 12.59 p.m., and any and all activity on her phone ended shortly before that. Those same police records show that shortly after arriving home, Patrick started deleting apps on his phone. But what he didn't think to delete was his Apple Health app, and that app ended up recording several significant health activities that occurred approximately at 1.35 p.m. In Patrick's confession, he didn't hesitate to explain why he did it. According to his story, Valerie had threatened to blackmail him into buying her a new car. He claims that she was going to tell people that he seduced her, and he wasn't going to let that happen. He then explained how they got into a pushing and shoving thing, and that he didn't know what to do with her while that was happening. When he was asked if he had planned on killing her when all of this went down, he said no, it kind of just happened. Patrick tells investigators that he pretty much figured she was dead after all of this happened. He didn't tell his wife or his family, and that they did not know anything about it. Then they asked him what he did after he killed her. He explained that he moved her body from his bedroom to his office, where he kept her for an entire day. The following day on June 8th, he goes to Home Depot and buys two-by-fours for the box that he made to put her body in. According to the arrest affidavit, it seems like he was actually not that forthcoming when it came to talking about going to Home Depot and buying wood, and this is all kind of confusing. It has been reported by some outlets that he already had the wood on his property, but records show that he did go out and buy it at Home Depot, but either way, the wood was definitely purchased and he used it to dispose of Valerie's body. As for where he buried her, Patrick said that the hole was already dug on his property, where he was planning to put cement. Now hearing this makes me, and I'm sure a lot of you wonder a few things. First of all, what was he planning to bury under the cement? I mean, does this show that this was premeditated? 
Did he plan on killing Valerie? Or did he have something else that he was planning to bury? What about those VHS tapes? What was on those? Why not just throw them out rather than bury them? Patrick stated that Valerie tried to seduce him after driving her back to his house. That is why he strangled her with his belt, because he said he was not going to have any of it from her. That is also why he put her in a black plastic bag while the family went on about their own business. The manhunt lasted for almost six months, all the while Scott knew that she was buried just 100 yards from her own front door. Scott accepted a plea deal pleading guilty to one count of murder and was sentenced to 57 years in prison. Her father, Jack Tyndall, said he had no remorse. She worked for him for more than two years, and there's no remorse at all. Makes me sick. And he didn't just murder her, he left her sit in that house. In a gut-wrenching moment of clarity. <sighs> Valerie Tyndall's mom and dad, Sheena Sandifer and Jack Tyndall, broke down in tears multiple times as they spoke to me for more than an hour, going over the gruesome details in their 17-year-old daughter's murder. It's the way he described everything so no artlessly, there was no, it was like it was not even a human He's being worked, speaking. She's worked for him for two years and he, there's no remorse yeah. at all. I went from being sad and now I'm just angry. I'm so angry. And I won't stop until there are answers. Jack and Sheena told me they never suspected their neighbor or someone they considered a friend would do this. They said Scott even consoled them after Tyndall disappeared. And that Scott and his wife Linda spoke to them the day after we now know Tyndall was murdered. It's a conversation they say they'll never forget. But they were definitely picking brains. You could tell they were trying to kind of steer us yeah. in their direction. Guiding. They wanted us to believe that she ran away. And tonight, they have a strong message for Scott. He's a freaking monster. You're heartless, soulless. You're a demon. And God will make you pay. Where are you at right now? This has got to be unbelievable for your family. I'm devastated. My daughter didn't deserve this. You know, we just want answers right now. We just want answers as to why. Why wouldn't you do this? She worked for him, right? They did. She worked for yeah, him, she but she also hung out with his family, like his granddaughter was her friend, and we went places with them, me and him, and her and him, and family, like everybody went together. For a long time, you guys yeah. were family friends? Yeah. In the last five months, had you talked to him about her at all, or did you see them at all? No, he ran his house every time I tried to talk to him. Well, at first, actually the first, um, week or so, I think it was the first week, right after we hung flyers, and I think it was day two we went out and hung flyers, and as soon as we came home they were there, and they kept coming over, you know, asking me if I was okay, and telling us, oh, I'm sure she's fine, she'll be back home. I left at 17, that's what his wife kept telling me, I left at 17, and I said, yeah, but that was different. You left and got married, your mom knew where you were, you didn't just vanish. Did you know in your mother's heart this is not her running away, that yeah. this is something well, is my child? I think I hoped, so I hung on to that. I wanted to believe that she did, but I didn't. To, uh, to know that she was found practically in your own backyard, I mean, it's devastating. She's my not how hard it was for me. Yeah, my blowing. I want to go there so bad. So much, every day. How are you still standing up? I do not know. It ain't easy. I've been up all night, crying with the hospital, crying. Is she your oldest? Or no, me? she's my middle, middle child. How would you describe her? <laughs> so sweet, and smart, funny, funny, very intelligent. She and she. I uh, saw something. You said she was getting her grades up. She was. She was. She went from comment. failing to uh, getting A's and B's. I was so proud of her, but I never got to tell her she that. She got a couple acceptance <laughs> letters from college. She was applying to college. Do you know what she wanted to do? What she, Pet <laughs> she wanted to be a vet. Yeah, she loved animals. And her schoolwork and her folder proved that. She had all kinds of paperwork filled out from schooling where she was studying animals. Please leave your comments below on what you think of this case. I just cannot think why a girl would allow herself to be taken in by him, unless he was really good at grooming her. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you back here next time for another true crime story. Be safe out there.